All right, church, go ahead and grab your Bibles and flip to Genesis chapter two. Um, we're gonna be in verses one through nine, kicking off tonight. We're gonna dive right in. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Chris Pletcher. I'm the lead pastor here at Antioch Salt Lake. I get the privilege of serving the house of God. Uh, King David said, I'd, I'd rather spend, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. He said that better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Um, so I would actually be a doorkeeper just to be close to the presence of God. But at this season of my life, he's asked me um, to lead and preach and teach with our elder team. But I love the house of God. Um, there is a zeal for the house of God that God has given, for, given to me. I did not grow up in the church. Um, I was adopted by God. And when you're adopted by God, you get brought into his family. So when I was in college, I met the family of God, which is called his church. And they became more of a family to me um, than in a lot of ways my, my family was able to be for what I truly needed uh, spiritually uh, at that stage in my life. And so I, um, I am honored and excited to be a part of this church family. And I'm honored and excited to kick off a brand new teaching season that's gonna span this month of April. Um, we're gonna read through Genesis 2 real quick and then I will tell you what it is called unless, oh yeah, you can go to our blog, thank you. You can, uh, all my scriptures and some of my sermon notes can be right in front of you if you choose to follow along that way. Um, but let's cue it up here, Genesis 2, one through nine. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created and the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. There was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Can we just take a deep breath together real quick? The breath of life. And man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, open our eyes tonight, enlighten our hearts tonight. Speak, Lord. Would you come and breathe on your word, make it living and active? We yield our hearts to you. Come on, just pray with me. Don't just listen. Say, I yield my heart to you tonight, Lord. And I say, come and instruct me. Teach me in your word. I invite you to come and shape what needs to be shaped. Form what needs to be formed. Breathe life into the places that have died. I come and ask you to, to revive the things that need to be raised up. To correct the things in me that need to be corrected. And I do this as I yield to your inspiration inspired word in Jesus mighty name amen the lord god planted a garden in eden and he put man in the garden he put us in a place called eden and you might be a Hebrew scholar, or if not, just go to blueletterbible.com because I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but it's an incredible resource. But the word Eden in Hebrew is a, the, is a word that means delight. It is a word that means pleasure. The root word for Eden is adon, which means to delight yourself. Watch this. 
to luxuriate, I didn't even know that that was a word, but to live in luxury, to live in a soft, comfortable, and pleasant manner. So God forms us from the dust of the earth and puts us in a garden named pleasure. Puts us in a region with him called delight. This was where God chose to dwell on the earth with his created representatives, a place called delight. As we know, they walked with God in the garden, in the cool of the day. And biblical scholars believe that this imagery of the garden and God in the garden with his created beings was symbolic of the place where he would rule over the earth in co-partnership with his created beings that he would sit in this garden throne room and he would rule over the earth with us. That was the design, that we would reign with God in a place called delight. The sermon series for the month of April, we're calling Back to Eden. And the title of tonight's message is From Duty to Delight. And I wanna show us in God's word tonight what the Lord has to say about pleasure. What the Lord has to say about your delight. And ultimately, what Jesus has to say about joy. You wanna go on a journey? This word Eden is found throughout the Old Testament and a lot of other passages, but usually it's not translated Eden, it's translated delight, or it's translated pleasure. In Nehemiah chapter nine, they're recounting the history of Israel, and they're recounting the time where they finally came into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, they finally came into this promised land, and it says in Nehemiah 9, watch, 24, the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with, the, with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land and took possession of houses full, someone say full, full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled. Somebody say filled. And became fat. Come on, somebody. Amen. And delighted themselves. They edened themselves in your great goodness. Eden was God's design. It was a pleasant place where humans dwelt with God and enjoyed his great goodness. And they took dominion over the affairs of the earth with the Lord. It was comfortable. It was soft. It was luxurious. It was pleasurable. It was abundant. It was delightful. Obviously, sin enters the picture quickly in Genesis chapter three in Eden, which you now know means what? Delight. Delight is replaced. This is gonna make a lot of sense of of how this transition happens so quickly. It's replaced with thorns and thistles and the sweat of your brow. Let me help us interpret this. Outside of God's presence, things get hard really fast. Inside God's presence is Eden. Delight, abundant pleasure. We begin to experience, after Genesis 3, a version of life not as it was intended. Struggle, strife, Scarcity, enmity, jealousy, conflict, and death. This is the sad history of humanity outside of the presence of God. But we know, praise God, 
there's good news. And the story of history is that God himself has never stopped pursuing the human race with his love and his mercy and his redemptive agenda from the old covenant to the new has always been aimed at making a way for us to re-enter his presence. In other words, for us to come back to Eden, to restore what was lost to invite us back into the place of connection, of intimacy, and yes, of having dominion again over affairs of the earth with him. And Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of this plan. We could sit and I could preach the gospel over and over, and, and I love to do that, but to get us where we're going, just remember Easter. Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, this is a great summary for how at the fulfillment of redemptive history, God has made us alive with Christ to bring us back to the garden. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it's worthless, your hope is, is empty, and you're still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, he is bringing up Adam to get them thinking about Eden. As in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, the second Adam, shall all be made alive. Through Jesus, we can be made alive. Again, salvation is a resurrection. You guys hear me preach this all the time. It is a miracle. We're, we're literally born again. The first time Jesus used this phrase, born again, it broke the brain of the most brilliant uh, Jewish theologian of the day, Nicodemus. You go, what? Born again? The new covenant mystery that Jesus came to bring, it was unlike anything that had been conceived of up to that point in redemptive history. But he came to make us alive and bring us back to Eden. Through this series, I, I hope to help us reclaim a biblical understanding of pleasure, but more importantly, to equip us to find our pleasure in God like never before. Church, we're gonna see plain as day in scripture tonight that not only were you created for pleasure, but the Bible unashamedly calls you to pursue pleasure in him. Let's start in Psalm 1, 1 through 4. We're gonna go through a handful of psalms, just kind of lay a foundation here. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his duty is to follow the law of the Lord. Wait, sorry, I think I misread that. Okay, um, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Church, we are unashamedly moving from duty to delight. And every religious bone in your body, this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Why? Because your heart can only be close to the thing that it finds delight and pleasure in. And so if you're not finding your delight in the Lord and you've had but you were made for pleasure, so you have to find pleasure somewhere. You'll go find your delight in somewhere, something else, but then you'll keep showing up to church, and you'll honor God with your lips, but your heart's far from him. Why? Because you found your delight in something other than the Lord. Get ready. We're going after all of it tonight. Delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And this man will be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit. Wow, sounds like John 15, just so you know, that's where we're going. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. 
please read this. This is like my life scripture. Arlena, put this. If Jesus, if I die before Jesus comes back riding on the clouds, please put this on my gravestone, all right? And then pray for my resurrection, all right? <laughs> Which you will. <laughs> In your presence. Someone say presence. presence. There's fullness of joy at your right hand. I want to make you say it with me. There are pleasures forevermore. Church body, you were made for pleasure. You were made for Eden. You were placed in a garden called delight. And you were made to find the fullness of your joy and the fullness of your pleasure in him at his right hand. Remember, they get kicked out of the garden and it's thorns, thistles, sweat of your brow. Outside of his presence, things get hard really, really fast. In his presence, there's joy, there's fullness of pleasure, and we find the light and easy yoke of Jesus. Yes, are we on a hard and narrow road? Yes, but we find the light and easy yoke. Why? Because we have access, if you didn't know, your new covenant privilege through the body and the blood of Christ into the presence of God where there's fullness of joy. So let me say fullness, please. Fullness. How precious is your steadfast love. This is Psalm 36. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink, this is so cool, from the river of your delights. In the Hebrew, it literally says, from the river of Eden, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Psalm 37, verse four. A lot of you guys are probably already thinking about this one. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Church, you are not only made for pleasure, made for delight, made and put in a garden called Eden, you are commanded by the word of God to pursue the fullness of your pleasure in God. And then the desire, desires of your heart will be satisfied. I'm gonna tell you why that can only happen in God in a minute. Psalm 45, six and seven. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. I hope this sounds familiar after the month of March. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. This is a psalm that is quoted in Hebrews chapter one, talking about Jesus. The Holy Spirit, through the writer of the book of Hebrews, grabs this Old Testament scripture, divinely inspired, and points at Jesus and says, it's talking about him. Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness beyond his companions. Proverbs 24 Three and four, by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant things. Proverbs 10, 23 says, doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. So, church, your desire, I, I hope tonight that that the Holy Spirit will reclaim pleasure for us and will reorient your understanding, your thought process of pleasure and delight and joy and your relationship with your pleasure and therefore your relationship with your God. I think that um, most of us need to be told that our desire for pleasure isn't wrong, but I think also probably many of us need to be told that most of our desires are probably, um, our desires for pleasure, our pursuits of pleasure um, might be misplaced, amen? So when we don't 
see, throw Psalm 1611, let's just go back to that one. When we don't understand, it says wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. So church, let's, it's 520, let's engage the brain. I want you to understand what God's word says. It says that the fullness of joy is in his presence and at his right hand is pleasure forevermore. I just want you to know, this is God's word. It doesn't care what you think about it. It doesn't care if, you, if your experience has been that or not. This is God's inspired word. The, the Bible actually says that not a, a single line of his word will pass away, that heaven and earth will pass away, that you and I will pass away. Your life, my life is but a vapor. And so this thing is gonna stand long after you and I are gone. This truth is gonna stand actually even when the heavens and earth have passed away. It doesn't care what you think about it but it does give you an opportunity to believe it. To understand something. That fullness of joy is with the Lord. It is in the Lord. And so then, the, then we get to start the, the real pursuit which is learning how to access that consistently. How, learning how to reorient our life's pursuit of pleasure around that. Are you seeing that? Yes. But if you don't believe it, you will never go through the work of rearranging your life to get it. Are you hearing me, church? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can we do that as an act of faith that we believe this? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, some of us, what is gonna be exposed right now is that you have joy, you have a major joy deficit in your life. You've had depression, you've had, uh, you've had serious issues. People, your friends would not say you're anointed with the oil of gladness. Hey, let your spell self be exposed, okay? Because God, oh my gosh, who came up here and, oh, Sosa. He said, I came to, can I say it again? It's so good. I came to church and the Lord said, you're prideful and you're lazy. And I was so thankful because he was talking to me, you know? It's so good, okay? The Lord is gonna speak to some of you and say, you have a joy problem because you don't believe this, or because you haven't arranged your life to pursue this. So let him, let him speak. So what happens is, in the vacuum of fullness of joy and pleasure in God's presence, because you were made for pleasure, what happens if you don't believe this and don't access it is that you will go find lesser, so we'll say lesser, and counterfeit pleasures somewhere else. Why? Because you were made for pleasure. You can't survive without joy, delight. And so if you don't access this, you with me? You will go find the counterfeit. Now, some of these counterfeits are morally neutral, okay? Maybe even gifts from God, the joy of good food, family, marriage, children, friendship, having meaningful work to do in the world, okay? Some of these things are morally neutral. They're gifts from God, they're wonderful gifts, but none of them contain the fullness. Oh, so you try to find your identity and your fullness. Oh, I just, I just wanna be married. It's a beautiful gift, but I'm telling you, it's never gonna be the fullness of joy. Oh, and it, okay, I thought marriage was gonna be the fullness. <laughs> wow, kids. Oh, we'll just have a bunch of kids. That'll solve my joy problem. 
It is. It's a gift. It is delightful. It is delightful. I have six children. You know this. We're dreaming about more. <laughs> it's a gift. It will never be the fullness. Your career, your job, your hobby, solitude, Alta, Snowbird, whatever your jam is, it's great. They're gifts. They're morally neutral. They're just not the fullness. Now, some of these counterfeits, um, these lesser joys, are actually made available through sin, and they are problematic. And not only can they not satisfy you or give you the fullness, but because they're in sin and they're sent from Satan and they're designed uh, nefariously, I will say, they are designed to offer you a counterfeit pleasure that has a hook in it into slavery. Every single bondage, I would say, I'm not gonna make some radical statement here. Many of our bondage issues are rooted in some pleasure that we found in sin. And that means that the good news is your bondage issues will break through when you believe that you got stuck in a counterfeit pleasure, your desire for pleasure is not wrong, and you learn how to find, and someone say fullness, the fullness. Are you seeing this? Counterfeit pleasures made available through sin don't just leave you dissatisfied, they leave you in bondage. Jeremiah said it like this, and I want you to know this whole paradox of what fountain are we gonna drink from, we're gonna see here, it, it breaks the heart of God. It actually shocks God's heart when we, when we look at Psalm 1611 and the offer of full pleasure at his right hand, and we say, no, I'll go find my own joy. And we go dig out something else. Watch this, Jeremiah 2, 12. It says, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed Two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The Lord is shocked. He said, Be appalled that I planted the fountain of life. Remember that Psalm 36? Drink from the river of delights, feast on the abundance of his house. I planted to them the fountain of fullness. And they turned away for it to go start digging out their own broken cistern, their own little hidden sin pleasure, their own little hobby to try to fill the void that Eden left and that will only be rediscovered in his presence. Satan cannot create. He can only deceive and distort. And so through deception and distortion of what God said, he offers counterfeit pleasures and his end goal is to actually make you a slave and destroy you. These pleasures offer a hit of euphoria that's usually easily obtained and often obtained outside of any relational cost. It's a hit of pleasure that costs you nothing. It's easy. But they're designed to keep you coming back for more. This is how the father of lies enslaves us. So church, we spent the month of March talking about reigning in life, loving righteousness, and being free from sin. Do you see why reigning in life over sin is 
central to the Christian gospel. It is not periphery issue. Our, our freedom from sin, our, our reigning in life, freedom from the bondage of sin, it is not a theological periphery. It is the point of the gospel to free you from the broken cisterns and take you back to Eden where you become, it's a, it, it, you become a, a, an alien and stranger on this earth because this is the tricky paradox now until Eden returns and the new Jerusalem descends and the new heavens and the new earth. There's gonna be a final restoration. We understand this, right? But now we live in this in-between where we have access to Eden because we have access to the presence of God. We have access to Eden, but we still live in thorns and thistles. And so you become a freak of nature on planet earth. You become an alien and stranger because you live on this planet but this planet has nothing that you need. It has nothing that you actually require from it. Everything you could ever want in fullness and joy of pleasure, you got before 7 a.m., before anybody else in your neighborhood even woke up to go chase after all their counterfeits. You got it in the presence of the Lord in your living room where Eden showed up again and you got to taste and see that in his presence is fullness of joy. You know how beautifully liberating that is? And then you get to go through your day and you've been satisfied from the fountain of living waters. And so then you, your wife wakes up and you just get to love her without needing her to give you the fullness. Oh, and then all your kids wake up and you just get to love them without needing them to fulfill all your dreams. And then you get to go to your job and you just get to be faithful with what God's asked you to do in this season of your life and still needing your, instead of needing your job to validate you, satisfy you, or give you some fullness. We have to reclaim a biblical understanding of pleasure. We have to. And, and gosh, I, I wanna just take two minutes to kind of tangent on something because um, our misplaced pleasure, and I say our, like us, uh, I say like as the global us, humanity, and I want to, I, I, would, I would love to think that the church, that we're so different than the world, but I, I think in most cases we're not, which is sad. And so I just wanna say us globally for a minute, our misplaced desires are killing us. And they're destroying our children and they're destroying our future. The pornography industry is the, late, is the largest counterfeit pleasure dealer on planet Earth. In the United States alone, it is a $34 billion a year industry. If it was publicly traded, it would rank in the top of Fortune 500 companies. This industry that thrives in the secret places is driving a whole other industry that I won't get into a lot of detail because of our mixed audience here, but an entire, I'm, not, I'm talking about the US, an entire industry of trafficking children, minors, to fulfill the deviant pleasure dreams that happened in the secret places of this $34 billion a year industry. Oh, but it's, it's not hurting anyone. No, it's fueling an entire industry. I'm not gonna tell you the numbers right now because honestly, it would shock your heart and it would derail us from where we're going tonight. But it is, it is appalling what's happening in the United States. The selling of, of sex. And, and the number one consumer 
in the United States of this particular market that I'm describing is a white male that makes over $100,000 a year, is married, and has two kids. Lord, help us. Our misplaced pleasures are killing us. They're ransoming our future and it's leaving a wide open door for the enemy to come after our children. And he is. And if we think we're gonna hang out in the safe and little secret house of the church and it ain't gonna come for us, we're fools. We gotta figure this out. Our misplaced pleasure is killing us. Okay, so church family, I've been preaching a lot lately about having a powerful gospel, amen? A gospel that is actually able to save, heal, and deliver you, right? To set you free. And, and I think that if we, the alternative to a powerful gospel is a powerless gospel. A powerless gospel leads to powerless living. So then we have to mutate the scriptures to justify our experience because we're not living in the full deliverance of the powerful gospel. You see what I'm saying? And so then we just look at each other and we justify all of our dysfunctions and stuff when we're supposed to be set apart in God's house. We're actually supposed to be way different. We're supposed to be city on a hill. Like, and and I, I do believe that God is doing a beautiful work in our local body. I'm not, I'm, this isn't like a, but I think this isn't a local like correction right now, but I think across the board of American Christianity, I don't know that the statistics of what is happening in the house is a whole lot different than what's happening outside of the house. Are you with me? So all that to say, breaking contracts is so necessary. It's so powerful. I'm re referring to what a lot of March was Breaking agreements, breaking contracts is so powerful. But if we don't learn how to then, because here's the, th the, the, the reality is those contracts were rooted in ple some pleasure that we were gaining. Are you with me? And so, cool, we have some emotional moment and we break the agreement, we, we break the contract. But there was a pleasure hit, a counterfeit pleasure hit that was being delivered every time we went there. And so if we don't actually learn how to then go and find the true pleasure in the Lord and his presence, are you following me, church? Then maybe I just don't know how sustainable that broken contract's gonna be. It's like when you kick the demon out of the house, but you don't fill the house with something else. And he just comes back and brings more. So, how we doing? <laughs> Help me, Jesus. I just want to pray for a minute, Lord Jesus. We, we, we thank you. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you, just as Caleb Gardner got up here and he testified. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. We thank you, Jesus. And right now, every place in the room where, where maybe we're, we're feeling exposed or we're, we're, we're seeing something new, we just thank you that it is your grace and it's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. And so... If we, don't, um, if we don't rearrange our life around our fullness of joy with the Lord, if we don't reorient wherever we're getting pleasure from to, to seeking first 
It's an issue of priority is, you know, most of the time it's like first. It's like the, if I'm satisfied here first, right, the, the chances of some counterfeit thing getting me are, are a lot lower, you know, because I'm full. And so we, we rearrange our lives around, around this place. And I said this title, this message is From Duty to Delight. Delight yourselves in the Lord. This is, I'll be honest, there, um, this week has been really hard for uh, just getting here. I won't get into details. I'm not trying to throw a pity party. But I just want to, I say that to say there's something about this word that um, um, I think has the ability to, to, to change your life and change things in this region if we really understand it. There's something about this revelation that, it's, that feels like the strongholds of this region are afraid of you finding your joy in God. So you might be feeling a little exposed right now. That's okay. Um, let him reveal any places where you've misplaced your joy because it's his kindness. And the good news is that the starting point of delighting in him is actually understanding that he delights in you. So this is where we're gonna land tonight. I'm gonna give a couple practicals and then we're gonna respond. Cool? Guess cool for like five more minutes and then let's act on it. So um, it's really hard to enjoy someone if you don't think that they enjoy you. In other words, your ability to delight yourself in the Lord requires faith that he delights in you first. If his, in his presence is this fullness of joy, at his right hand, there are pleasures forever. So if you believe that that way into his presence is wide open and that he's ready and waiting for you because he's on the throne of grace that's opened by the blood of Jesus, he's ready and waiting to receive you and he loved you, delighted in you first, then you're gonna have a ton of confidence, which is what Hebrews 4 says, actually, to run into the throne of grace to delight in him because you know that he delights in you. Are you following me? Yes. And so, Psalm 18. Let's go to Psalm 18. Let's get verse, the, the second. He sent me from on high. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued. It's all this salvation language. All this salvation language. Go to the next slide. He rescued me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. How many, that verse makes you just kind of feel a little uncomfortable. Like, let's be honest. Because I know that for many, many years, even a little bit still now, it's like just even saying that, I'm like, you delight in me? Wait, you didn't just rescue me because you're gracious and you're really good and merciful. And even though I am terrible, you're merciful. <laughs> Wait, you rescued me because you delight in me? Zephaniah 3, 14, 17. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, rejoice. Why? The Lord's taken away. Next slide. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He's cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear Evil. Go to the next slide. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will rejoice. He will delight over you with loud singing. I've got more verses. We don't have time. And that's the old covenant. 
In the New Testament, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, which includes you, he gave his one and only son. Galatians 2, 20, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice how Paul made it really personal. He loved me. He delighted in me. He gave himself for me. But God, being rich in mercy, Ephesians 2, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given that we should be called children of God. But then one of the most famous passages in all scripture, John 15, this beautiful, we're not gonna dig into it, the beautiful, the vine, the branches, all this stuff, it's like the fulfillment of, of revelation history and Jesus is talking about a, a garden. Have you ever thought that maybe John 15 was trying to get us back to Eden? And he says, abide in my, what church? Love. You will never delight in the Lord if you don't believe he delights in you. You will never abide in his love. You will never run confidently to discover the fullness of your pleasure and joy if you think you're gonna get there and he's just gonna be disappointed, angry, you know, whatever with you. We gotta believe this delight. And so let's look at John 15 real quick here and worship band, y'all come join me up here and, and I'm actually gonna ask our elder team and wives if you guys would actually come be our response team if you don't mind. If you guys could come up here, elder, elders and wives, Arlena, you too, babe. Um, and as you guys come up here, Blake, grab this handful of the oil of gladness because you might just need to get anointed tonight with the oil of gladness as, as we respond. So just hand them out, Blake. As the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. So now watch this. This is the game changer right here. At the end of this famous passage on abiding in John 15, Jesus says, he tells us why he's telling us this. He says, these things I've spoken to you. That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be, say it with me, full. In his presence, his fullness of joy, at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. It's amazing that Jesus was the most joyful person to ever live. It's amazing that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. And it's amazing because he's also called the man of sorrows, who's acquainted with grief. And your mind, like mine, might have a hard time with that. But one of my favorite Bible teachers says that Jesus is perfect theology. And so whether or not we can wrap our heads around that fully or not, it's perfect. He was the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and yet he was the most joyful person that ever walked the planet. What does that tell us about joy? That it actually doesn't matter. The real grief and sorrow that we walk through and the experience, why? Because we're aliens and strangers. We still live in thorns and thistles. Our citizenship is in an entirely different realm. We don't belong here. No, we have access to the fullness of joy, but we still have to grow, go out into this crazy, fallen, all the stuff, and survive. Your joy. 
Usually when we think of John 15, we think of fruit. Well, we think that John 15 is about our fruit. No. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you. The whole point I'm telling you this message, so that my joy may be in you and your joy would be full. Because he knows that a joyful life in the presence of God will be a fruitful life. But if you're not learning how to walk back into Eden, taste and see, you'll never actually have a sustainably fruitful life because all your pleasure things are gonna be plugged into the wrong sources. So I, I think the invitation tonight is I didn't even part two next week part two I promise you we will get more practical but maybe tonight the Lord just wants us to actually believe something wants us to actually believe that there's a fullness for us can we stand up and respond together I want to open the altar here first and foremost I want you to respond to the Holy Spirit these guys are up here to pray and, and, you, and, and it's confidential, but I just had this picture of our elder team with the oil of gladness. So I don't know. I don't know if there's something you need to confess. I don't know. I just respond to the Holy Spirit. But we're going we're gonna to sing a song some of you guys are familiar with. It's, it's called Fountains. And it's just fitting. The Lord kind of spoke it over this moment because it's, it's fitting. It's a return song. It's that Jeremiah 2, like, if we've, if we've dug out broken cisterns and they're not holding water for us, there's an invitation back to the fountain. You know what I'm saying? There's an invitation back. And there's a new song that we're actually going to sing at some point as well. So just respond. But, but there's a new song that was actually written here in this house, and and. In a way, I feel like it's supposed to be a, a, a declaration for us of where we find our joy. So yeah, as you, as, you, as you need to, I wanna invite you to respond. Lord Jesus, thank you. You're the Lord that searches hearts and minds. And I thank you, God. This, this might feel, I don't know what you're feeling right now, but I thank you, Lord, for the hope of this invitation that in your presence there's fullness of joy, that you made us for pleasure, and it's in you. So come, Holy Spirit, lead us back to Eden. It's in your mighty name I pray, amen.